since tomato season is just about around the corner, I thought it'd be a good time to go over some uh, garden problems. And one of those I thought that would be really appropriate is virus diseases on tomatoes. It seems to be one of our bigger problems that we have with tomatoes around here. So one of the benefits we have of living in the land of little rain is that most places where they struggle with fungal diseases like early blight and all sorts of disgusting things that fungus can cause, we don't really have to worry that much about it. We don't have very many fungal diseases, but I guess the trade-off is we have a whole bunch of viral diseases to worry about. And that's usually what most of our tomato problems that come into the Master Gardener Helpline are related to. So there's three main viral diseases that we're going to cover in this. Of course, there's more than just three out there, but three tend to generate most of the questions to us. The first is tobacco mosaic virus. The second is tomato spotted wilt virus. And the third is the beet curly top viruses. Let's start with tobacco mosaic virus. This virus is common throughout the world. It's a pretty interesting virus. And so I think you might find, uh, you know, as far as viruses go, it's somewhat attractive. This is what the symptoms look like on tomatoes and potatoes. This disease affects things that are related to tomatoes, like tobacco and potato, tomato, you know, nightshade family things. So on the left, you can see that the tomato has some yellow color that's sort of mottled and random throughout it. It also has some puckering going on in this picture. It doesn't always have puckering, but th that's not uncommon. And if you look at the right, you can see that the model uh, design of the virus on the potato much more clearly. So it's sort of random yellow splotches on the potato. And that is happening on the tomato, it's just not quite so dramatic. But it's called a, a mosaic uh, disease because it does have these random irregular uh, yellow mottled color throughout the plant on the fruit. Here it is on tobacco. Tobacco you can really see the modeled effect of the disease going on. So, you know, as far as diseases go, it's at least kind of attractive. Here's another shot of the disease on tomatoes. Now this is more typical when I see this disease of what we see. It's sort of a subtle effect. There might be some uh, puckering or misshaping going on as a, like the leaf in the back there. But leaf on the front is pretty typically what we see. And it, will usually be throughout the whole plant and it's often on you know more than one plant. Here's what it looks like on a tomato fruit. So it, it's yellow uh, pale areas that are just um, all throughout the the fruit there. Sometimes they have brown areas uh, associated with that. Uh, you know it, it, it's not every bit of the fruit covered yellow. It's more like you know mosaic spots on it. Um, the yellow pale dispersed areas on leaves are kind of the, the most common symptom that you're going to encounter with that. The misshapenness, well, that's common too, but you'll notice the, the pale color probably first. It's kind of an interesting virus. It's a single-stranded RNA virus, but it's got this really tough coat protein, and it can be viable for 50 years or even longer. So if the virus particles are laying around or on something, it's possible to infect something even after decades. This virus is usually transmitted mechanically. So that means that if the virus particles are on you know, equipment or hands or clothes and you brush up against the plant and you cause some sort of abrasion, you can transfer the virus that way. So it's really common when people work um, you know, with several plants that are susceptible and they've got the virus uh, on their hands or on their clothing that they spread it along a field. So, you know, if, if it's one worker working along a row and that's the person who has the virus on their hands or their tools, you might see it in a row. Whereas if the person works through the entire greenhouse or a garden, they may spread it through all the tomatoes. So some strategies to deal with this, I mean, really the only thing you can do is avoid it. An important thing to do is, is don't let smokers handle your plants or even the seeds. If they do need to handle it, have them wear gloves. The tobacco virus, it, it, it's so tough and strong that it's it's easy to get on cigarettes and um, you know there's a potential for infection. I've actually seen um, you know a smoker uh, be able to transmit it. So just to be safe, if someone smokes, have them wear gloves. For most people, the best thing to do is to disinfect tools. 
So if you have a tool that's been interacting with a plant you suspect uh, that has tobacco mosaic virus, disinfect it. Usually you know, some kind of diluted bleach solution will do the trick. If you have a plant that's infected, um, you know, and you, you decide you want to save the the fruit for seeds, that's a really good way to, to spread the disease because the seeds can have it on there. So don't save uh, any seeds or share them if your plants are infected. Probably the best thing to do is whenever you notice an infected plant, just go ahead and um, you know, put some gloves on, remove that plant, uh, get it in the trash, and get it out of your garden. So the next viral disease is tomato-spotted spot, tomato spotted wilt virus. Some years this is really bad in our area, other years we don't see it at all. It's kind of neat about this one is that it affects many, many crops and weeds. It's a very big list. It's like more than a hundred uh, plants can be affected by it. It does affect the fruit, so it's of commercial importance. We usually see it in this area causing stunting when we have a, an infection. And the thing that makes it the spotted wilt virus is that it has leaf spots with some rings. So the picture I'm showing, because it shows the symptom better, is a pepper plant. And we'll zoom in on it in another slide, but you can see there's little circles on it where the, the virus is infected. So the exact symptoms actually vary on each plant. So it's not 100% consistent, but uh, there are some things to look for that I'll show you. Locally, when I see this, um, maybe the strain that we have around here, it seems to be worse where the leaflets on the tomato um, connect to the plant. That, that's where the, most of the, the symptoms will show up. And I've got a picture of that. Here's a close-up of the pepper plant. So you can really see the ring shape effect of this uh, of the symptoms. So this is a, a common viral infection pattern in a garden. So the, the plant, you know, symptomatically here, it, it's stunted, and if you were to look up close, you'd see that it, it has spots on the leaves. But, but notice how it's stunted, and all the plants around look fine. It's really common with viral diseases to have individual plants or just a few plants in a group, a cluster, to be affected, and things around will not be affected. So that's kind of indication that potentially have a viral problem. You know, other types of, you know, biological issues might come from the side of a field and, and spread out. Um, abiotic things might be in like rows or in entire areas. I mean, you're going to have a different pattern. But with uh, viruses, it's really common for individual plants. So do look for that. So I found this picture on the internet, but this really matches the symptoms that I've seen um, around here when the, the virus is present. So if you look where the leaf uh, the leaflets attach, uh, it seems to have more of the ring spots uh, present in that area and some maybe puckering going on too. Yeah, it might be throughout the plant, but... Um, that's that's the most common areas we see. So this is a really common symptom that I, I usually uh, would have no problem recognizing around here. So there's a little illustration of the area that looks a little worse. At least it seems worse to me. It doesn't always look like that. This is a, another picture of this disease, and it doesn't really have very clear spots. They're pretty small, but it, it does have it, and um, it makes it a little hard to diagnose this sometimes because it can be ambiguous. And if you're not real good at um, looking at symptoms, you might confuse it with something else. The fruit, on the other hand, is pretty distinctive. When you have the virus and the, a fruit is formed, it makes kind of a really interesting swirly circle effect that doesn't really look like uh, tobacco mosaic or the other common diseases we have around here. What I have noticed, though, at least for the infections that I've been seeing, uh, usually the infection happens early enough in the season that we don't even get fruit. So you're not even lucky enough to get to this uh, point right here to confirm that that's what you have. But sure enough, if you get fruit, that's what it looks like. So I just wanted to go over some of the differences between tobacco mosaic and tomato spotted wilt viruses so that you can differentiate the two. With tobacco mosaic, you're looking for these yellowish mottled zones. That's the, the main issue. And to me, I'd call that like a, an interesting leaf pattern because uh, it, it's so random and it's 
you know, like a mosaic. Um, but on the fruit, when you do have symptoms on the fruit, the design is kind of boring looking. It's not very exciting. It's not pretty, but uh, it, it just doesn't, you know, go, wow, what's this weird thing? Also, we don't tend to see a lot of dead spots on the leaves. Mostly it's yellowing. And the stunting, um, you know, is minimal to moderate. A lot of times there won't even be much noticeable stunting at all. You know, to contrast that with tomato spotted wilt virus, there can be yellow, but there's usually dead spots on the, the leaves. So that, that's kind of the, the big difference right there. And then the spots can be rings. So they're not just weird, uh, irregular modeling. It's, it's ring spot types. There's usually noticeable stunting around here when we have it. And when you do have the symptoms on the fruit, they're kind of exciting and interesting looking, not boring. So that's some hints that help you tell them apart. So the next slide has just some pictures maybe to help make that clearer. So on the left is tobacco mosaic. There's some puckering and yellow modeling going on. And on the right is uh, tomato spotted wilt virus. And you can see it's got the ring spots with you know the necrosis, the, the dead tissue going along with it. So this virus is spread by insects. Tobacco mosaic was spread by mechanical transmission, but this one is spread by small insects called thrips. And thrips are really tiny little guys, but um, they move uh, with the wind. They've got these fringed wings that can drift a long ways. And their mouth parts are rasping, so they have very distinctive uh, insect feeding that I'll show you a picture of. The way this works is that the thrips larva, especially the really young ones, uh, acquire the, the virus when they're feeding. The older the thrips get, the harder it is for them to acquire it, but when they're really young, right after they hatch out, it's uh, easy for them to acquire it. And then throughout their life, after they've acquired the disease, they can then spread that virus. And since they move through air currents, it's pretty easy for this to get spread. The thrips that's most common uh, for spreading this in the, our gardens, the western flower thrips, are really widely spread. So it's uh, you know, it's not hard to find these insects around. Thrips are very difficult to control. Uh, so you know, controlling thrips would sound like a really good strategy, but you're not going to be able to necessarily just directly control them. You have to use more um, strategic thinking to get rid of this problem. There's an example of thrips damage on verbena. Obviously not a tomato, but it's really distinctive of the kind of feeding that they have. They're sort of rasping at the, the leaf tissue, kind of breaking up the cells and eating up the, the, the gunk. It's kind of like the way uh, people would eat ribs. That's how the thrips eat. So some strategies to deal with thrips. I think the key thing with with this whole problem with this disease is to monitor and if possible you know control the thrips but definitely monitor them it's good to keep an eye on thrips populations in the garden if you have unusual symptoms on tomatoes and you have thrips it's not hard to infer that the problem is probably uh, tomato spotted wilt virus so knowing that you have thrips is a really good tool for diagnosing um, the problem. And you know, you're going to have other feeding damage if you have high thrips populations too. So you, know, you want to monitor that. And I'll show you on another slide how we do that. Probably a more realistic strategy than trying to control thrips directly because, boy, they, they're really tough to control. But to control weeds, you know how to do that. If you can keep weeds pulled, you're going to help to uh, alleviate potential sources of the virus because a lot of our weeds have it and you're going to have fewer places for thrips to, to hang out and move into your garden. So try to keep your weeds under control. You know, locally if you have the option don't plant a bunch of susceptible plants like tomatoes right next to the desert. You know, maybe have a, a fence up um, to help protect you know you from the, the desert. Cause a lot of our native plants are reservoirs for this virus. So try not to be right next to the desert, and uh, that may help some. I mean, you may even you know, want to plant something tall like corn or something between uh, the desert and your tomatoes just to try to act as some sort of a barrier. I don't think that will help much, but at least the more space you can put, the better off you'll be. 
And fortunately, with this disease, there are resistant varieties. So if you look in a seed catalog, you, you know you have a problem with this virus. You know, look up some of the resistant varieties and try planting some of those. There is information at the UC IPM website on controlling thrips, but like I said, it's it's really tough at home to well, even commercially, get good control of thrips. So good cultural practices like keeping good control of weeds really makes a difference. So this is a monitoring card. This is a yellow sticky card shown in the, the big picture. It gives you an idea of the scale of thrips, how small they are. So you can see compared to that dime, they're just little specks. So when you go look at your sticky card, you're just looking for little, very small reddish rods, and that's going to be... A, uh, western th flower thrips. I like yellow traps because they collect a variety of insects including thrips so you can see what's going on in terms of other insect problems in the garden but if you're just really interested in only looking at thrips blue is much better at attracting thrips than other insects so you can use blue sticky uh, cards too as an option. So the final virus I wanted to cover is the beet curly top viruses these are a complex of uh, Gemini uh, viruses, and there's there's more than one. And because of that, the symptoms can vary dramatically. But we'll go over what we see around here. This virus causes the curly top disease, and this is very common in the Owens Valley. And you know the curly top disease is that usually the uppermost leaves uh, curl up and get a funny little color to them, and the plant just never grows quite right. And this is caused by a virus. It's one of the earliest uh, recognized viruses. It's been known for like a hundred years. So the, the symptoms are upward curled leaves and they usually get a purple or kind of grayish tint to them. When you have the virus in the plant, the fruit won't ripen right. That's assuming the plant was old enough um, before infection to even have fruit. Sometimes if you plant them and you get an infection while the plant is still really small, you may never even get fruit. It does cause stunting. Um, the stunting varies by the age of the plant. And it also causes kind of a stiff, unusual stems. It's clearly something's wrong with the plant when you see those stems, but the big diagnostic tool is the upward curled purplish colored leaves and then the weird fruit. This usually follows the typical virus infection pattern, so you'll be individual plants um, will get sick and other ones will not, even if they're all the same variety. Although some years, particularly in mild winters uh, in the Owens Valley, you know, it, it may wipe out all the tomatoes just because there's so many um, of the, the leaf hoppers coming through and spreading the virus. So, you know, perfect conditions, it's individual plants, but it's not uncommon, especially, you know, south of Big Pine for entire gardens to get wiped out. So it can be confused with a physiological problem that's not the curly top virus. And, and tomato plants, just in certain environmental conditions, some varieties will uh, tend to have the leaves roll up anyways. But they roll up differently, and it's not a problem. The way you can tell the two apart is that there'll be no abnormal color with physiological leaf roll. It's just the leaves curling. It won't be purplish. It won't be, you know, just at the top. It'd be, you know, older leaves usually, and they'll just kind of curl up. It will usually affect all plants of one or two varieties, and other varieties won't be affected at all. Um, that's because the, the varieties are all, you know, close genetic, um, you know, makeup so they're all being affected similarly and it tends to happen in hot weather it's uh, related to that so during the monsoon is the most common time that we'll see physiological leaf roll you won't tend to see it on an individual plant so if you have two or three of the same variety usually all three of those varieties will be doing it again this is nothing to worry about it's not a virus it's just something that happens and it's harmless this is how the virus gets spread. This is the beet leafhopper. It's a little insect that will overwinter in the, the slopes of the Sierra and it moves around uh, into the, the lower areas and infects our plants with this virus. There's lots of, of this virus in wild sources and 
you know, it, it has it in it, and it's not really interested in tomatoes per se. It wants something probably related to sugar beets, um, you know, some native kind of weed. But as it's moving into the valleys in April and May, it will land on individual tomato plants, thinking it might be something interesting, take a little bite of it, decide that it's not what it wants, and moves on. But in the process, it will infect the tomatoes. So we usually see curly top uh, in the Owens Valley. It's worse as we go further south. And um, you know Bishop gets it, but it's not nearly as bad as, say, Lone Pine gets it. It doesn't seem to be very common in the Mesa. It uh, isn't very common in Chalfont. We've, I got my first call about it last year, so it's present, but it's not as bad as um, we have further south. I've never had any calls about it from anyone gardening in Benton, and we don't expect to see it, you know, in the, the higher elevations. So, uh, you know, above 6,000 feet, I wouldn't expect it at all. So most people who have had bad luck with this just throw their arms in the air and have given up on growing tomatoes, or they just plant tomatoes, they see it, and they just throw them out you know, and get frustrated. But there are some strategies that we can do to control this. And one of the reasons why I'm recording this you know, in early April is you need to do them soon um, so that you have some success, because you, know, you want to implement these right when you plant. So the first strategy is confusion. Things like shade cloth and reflective mulch and maybe even spraying your plants with kale and clay will make the plants not look like something that the beet leaf hopper is interested in trying out as lunch. So it, it, it's looking for something, clearly. And the thing it wants is not tomato, but it's not real smart. It's an insect. So it lands on there, takes a bite, and moves on. So if you can make it look like something different, they may not decide to land there at all. So try confusion. Shade cloth is probably going to be the most effective way to keep them from landing, but reflective mulch might help too. Another strategy that's been shown is to change the plant density. So individual plants look, especially when they're young, look like something to the leafhopper that it wants to, to test out as food. So if you can plant things closer together, or maybe you have a companion plant with it so that it you know, is somewhat obscured, anything that make the plant density more, you're less likely to have the leafhopper land on it. So try to plant closer together. And then the third option is to change the timing of when you plant. Either plant earlier, so you have a larger plant at the time that the leafhoppers are moving through, and hopefully the canopy has grown together so it doesn't look like an individual plant. Or you can plant later and hope that they've already moved through. Um, in that case, you would plant heat-tolerant tomato varieties so that you know they can tolerate and, and still set fruit in the summer heat. So a, a timing issue might help too. So those are the, the three strategies for dealing with beet leafhopper. None of them are perfect, but it does present some sort of opportunity to grow tomatoes if you live in an area that's just been pounded with these uh, leafhoppers for a few years uh, to have a better chance of success. So there are other viruses that we have around here, but th those are the three main ones. If you think you have a virus problem and indications that you might, might be an individual plant here and there uh, that you see and you don't has unusual symptoms, uh, or if you have a lot of thrips and you still see some weird stunting, you want to know, you know, is this a virus? We, you know, we might be able to help you. So if you have questions about tomatoes, virus problems or otherwise, contact our helpline. You can reach it at immg at ucanr.edu, or you can call the helpline, this phone number, or you can even leave us a message on Facebook at Inyomono Master Gardeners. Thanks for listening. I hope you found this helpful. I'm hoping to do little informational sessions maybe every week, especially while we're all out of the office. And we hope you have good luck in the garden. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye.